In this video, I'm going to cover alkenes, alkynes, and aromatic hydrocarbons. So an alkene is a functional group um, that has a carbon-carbon double bond. And remember, functional groups are patterns of atoms that appear in different molecules and uh, have similar properties between those, those molecules um, because of that same pattern of atoms. So functional groups allow us to put molecules into categories. Um, and one of those categories is alkene, which is uh, compounds that have a carbon-carbon double bond. And so remember, um, in order for carbon to have a double bond, one of the bonds is a sigma bond, and one of the bonds in a double bond is a pi bond. And so a sigma bond, remember, is uh, made by the head-on overlap of two um, s orbitals or sp orbitals or s sp2 or sp3 orbitals. So orbitals that have an s component, they'll meet head-on like this. And when they meet head-on um, in this fashion, that means that if this atom, if this p orbital were to start spinning like a propeller, it would not disrupt the overlap between these two. Uh, sp2 orbitals. Sigma bonds have, um, uh, they are able to rotate, they have this rotational symmetry so that as the p orbital rotates it does not disrupt this overlap. Um, and the other, so this is one component of a double bond, the overlap between two orbitals containing an s component. And the other component of a double bond is the pi bond. And the pi bond is made by the parallel overlap of two p orbitals. So it doesn't look like it because of this depiction here. They're pretty far away. But um, actually, these p orbitals are close enough that they're overlapping. The sp2 orbitals overlap and the p orbitals overlap. So you know, if we were to draw them really, really big, something like this. Right? So the p orbitals are actually overlapping too. Um, it, it makes they're not that much bigger than the sp2, so it's hard to draw a picture that shows the sp2 orbitals overlapping and the p orbitals overlapping. But this is kind of what's happening with the p orbitals, and they've got a lobe down here that does the same, the same thing. So um, this is the pi bond component, and this is the sigma bond component down here. So the sigma bond can rotate if the p orbital starts moving like a propeller spinning around in a circle that doesn't disrupt the, the sigma bond but it does disrupt the pi bond because you can see that the pi bond is created by the overlap of these two parallel p orbitals and so if this one were to start spinning it's going to disrupt this overlap here and this overlap down here so a pi bond cannot spin a sigma bond can spin So um, the, remember the p orbitals are overlapping. There's a pair of electrons in those p orbitals. And so sometimes when we draw them overlapping, we kind of show this uh, situation here. And so really what's happening is that um, the electrons form uh, a plane kind of electron density both above and below the, um, the flat uh, network of sigma bonds here. So we have a carbon-carbon sigma bond, carbon-hydrogen sigma bonds here, and it makes kind of this flat two-dimensional structure like this. And then on the top and on the bottom there is electron density. Remember the blue and the green are just different phases of that orbital, so like positive and negative amplitude of that uh, standing wave. And so above and below the sigma network is uh, some electron density in, in these pi orbitals, this uh, pi molecular orbitals. So we can see that here in an electrostatic potential map. That shows that the red areas are electron rich and the blue areas are electron poor. So the hydrogen atoms are having their electrons pulled toward the carbon atoms, so there's some polarity here. And the um, above and below where those electrons are is electron rich. That's the red areas. So naming alkenes is very similar to naming alkanes. The, uh, remember, when we name alkanes, we look for the longest chain first. And uh, we name that parent chain 
based on the parent compound. So one carbon is methane, two carbons is ethane, and so on. Um, the meth and eth and prop and bute and pent and hex and so on, those prefixes, those refer to the number of carbons. One, two, three, four, um, respectively. But the, uh, uh, the, the suffix ane, so if we're talking about um, pentane or hexane, the ane in that in the name of that molecule refers to the functional group, which is carbon-carbon single bonds. So when we have carbon-carbon double bonds, we have alkenes. So instead of this a two-carbon molecule being called ethane with a single bond, it's called ethene with a double bond because it's not an alkane, it's an alkene. So we change the ending. Eth means two carbons, ene means there's a double bond. So ethene is a molecule that has two carbons that are double bonded together. Propene, prop means three carbons, and ene is a double bond. So propene is a molecule that has a double bond with uh, three carbons. And then there's bute. Bute means four carbons, so butene. But when I have four carbons, then I have a choice of where the double bond goes. Does it go between carbon one and two, or does it go between carbon two and three? And you might ask, well, can't it also go between carbon 3 and 4? Well, yes, that's technically true, but if you flip that over, it's actually just between 1 and 2 then. We would just rename 3 and 4, we'd call them 1 and 2. So the idea is that if I put, a, if I put it over here at 3 and 4, it's really the same structure as this one. So there's only two unique structures that I can get by moving the double bond around. This one called 1-butene, where, where the double bond starts at carbon 1. And this one called 2-butene, where the carbon starts, or excuse me, where the double bond starts at carbon 2. Um, so a bond between carbon 2 and 3 is going to get the number 2. A bond between the numbers 3 and 4 would get the number 3. A bond between 1 and 2 gets the number 1. So this system here where we say butene, and we put the number out front, 1-butene, because we, there's two different kinds of butene now. I can't just say it's, it's butane, where there's only one type. There's two types of butene, one butene like this and two butene like this. So this is actually an old way of naming molecules. So the old IUPAC name would put the uh, um, would put the number out in front of the functional group. So in one butene. So we'd put the number referring to where the double bond is. The placement of the double bond would go at the very front of the molecule. Um, that's the way of doing it in old. That's the, the blue ones here are the old names. The new names, the way that we do it now is we move that one inside because the remember the butte refers to the number of carbons. So butte, one, two, three, four. And the ene refers to the double bond. So here's the double bond. So the idea is let's put the one in front of what it's referring to. The one refers to the placement of the double bond. So let's move the one right in front of the, the suffix that refers to the double bond. So instead of one butene, now this, the name of this compound is but one ene. So the one has been moved to, to more obviously specify that it belongs to this double bond placement. And here, one pentene. Pent refers to one, two, three, four, five carbons. Ene refers to the fact that there's a double bond somewhere. And one tells me that the double bond is between carbons one and two. So pent one ene is the new name. Um, Bute two ene to show us that the, the, the ene, the double bond, is at carbon two, starts at carbon two. Or here, pent two ene, the double bond starts at carbon two, and there's five carbons. So um, we also sometimes encounter uh, compounds that have rings in them. So the only difference is if I have a carbon or, or a molecule that has six carbons and they're all single bond, if they're all single bond then I know that it's an alkane. If it has six carbons I know that it's a hex. So that molecule would be hexane. Well if those six carbons instead of being in a, a zigzag chain, if they're in a hexagon, then it's still six carbons. They're still all six, they're still all single bonded, so it's still hex and it's still ane. But now it's in a ring, so all I have to do is add cyclo. Cyclo indicates that there's a ring. So it's hexane when it's in a chain, and it's cyclohexane when it's in a ring.
So if it were uh, just an alkane, it would be cyclopentane, but since there's a double bond, we call it cyclopentene. And if it has a branch on it, then I have to start numbering the ring somewhere. So the numbers in uh, an alkene, in a cycloalkene, the number always starts at one. So where the double bond is, the double bond shows us where carbon one is. Wherever the double bond happens to be in the molecule, we call the beginning of that carbon number one and the end of the carbon number two. Um, and so for example, I could go here and go call it one, two, or I could start here and call it one, two. Um, but it, the, we want to, the, the placement of the double bond determines which carbon is number one, but I also want to make sure the branches have the lowest number. So if I did one, two, then this would be the methyl branch would be at carbon two. But if I do the numbering this way, one, two, then the methyl branch is at carbon one. So then that has the lowest numbers and uh, the double bond indicates where the carbon one is. And we look at this one, I could say that this is carbon one and this is carbon two, but that's going to go one, two, three, four, five. That's going to make my methyl branch carbon five. Instead, it's better to number it this way, one, two, three. The double bond is still between carbons one and two, but now, since I've switched it to go this way, now the methyl branch is at three instead of five. So when I only have one double bond in the ring, I don't need to indicate that it's one cyclopentene or cyclopent-1-ene. I don't have to say one-ene. I don't have to say where the double bond is when it's in a ring, because when it's in a ring, wherever it is, it's always at one. So the the one in this case is not referring to the placement of the double bond the one in this name is referring to the placement of the branch this is a methyl branch and it's at carbon one so i call this one methyl cyclopentene and same over here the number here is not referring to the uh, number of the uh, the double bond this number three is referring to the number of the branch the methyl branch Okay, when I have double bonds, I have uh, multiple double bonds, then I have to give each of them a number. So if there was only one double bond, I'd call this one, uh, but one ene in the new name, but one ene, or one butene in the old name. But if there's two double bonds, then I have one that's between carbon one and two, and I have another double bond here that's between carbon three and four, I have to indicate that there's two double bonds. When there's one double bond, it's an ene. When there's two double bonds, it's a diene. When there's three double bonds, it's a triene, and then a tetraene. Uh, this tetraene, octa, oh yeah, it looked like it wasn't spelled right, I was just not looking at it right. Tetraene, so four double bonds. So when I have more than one double bond, not only do I have to indicate that there's more than one by saying ene, diene, triene, tetraene, and so on, indicating the number of double bonds, but I also have to indicate where they are on the molecule by giving them a number. So here, two double bonds is a diene. One of the double bonds starts at carbon one, one of the double bonds starts at carbon three. So this is one, three, diene, and there's four carbons all together. So this is a 1,3-butadiene in the old name. And in the new name, we'd say buta to refer to the four carbons. And then 1,3-diene. 1,3, two double bonds. This is a 1,3,5-triene. 1,3,5-triene. And it has 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 carbons all together. So it's a hepta 1, 3, 5 triene. And finally, we have one with a cycle, a circle, so it has 8, so it's an octa. It's a 1, 3, 5, 7 tetraene. So octa 1, 3, 5, 7 tetraene. And then since it's in a ring, we put cyclo in front. Cyclo octa 1, 3, 5, 7 tetraene. So the names can obviously get pretty long and difficult to, to come up with and difficult to write and say, but the idea is that the name is not just some unique word that stands for that shape or that molecule. The name is also a description of the molecule. 
The name cycloocta-1357 tetraene is a very descriptive name for that molecule that tells us exactly what that molecule is, how many atoms there are, what, what the bonding is, that they're single bonds and double bonds and where they are in the molecule. So this IUPAC nomenclature gives us a very descriptive name for a molecule that allows us to, to look at this molecule and, or look at this name and draw this molecule, or look at this molecule and draw this name. These things are interchangeable. Okay, so we can have isomers of alkenes, just like we can have isomers of alkanes, where the compound, uh, two compounds have the same chemical formula, but the atoms are in different places, different shaped molecules. So here's an example where I have one, two, three, four carbons. So with four carbons, I can have a double bond between one and three. This is, uh, or excuse me, between one and two. This is one butene. Here's one, two, three, four carbons. This is two butene because the double bonds between carbon two and three. And here's another one, two, three, four, two butene. So I have one butene, two butene, and another version of two butene. So I have three different isomers of butene here that all have the same number of atoms, but the shape of the molecule is different and the, therefore the properties are different. They're different molecules. So this one is obviously easy to see. One butene is different than two butene because the double bond's in a different place. So this one, okay, it's easy to see that that's different. But here we have two butene and two butene. These are both two butene. The way in which they're different is that in this one, the CH3 groups, if I were to draw a line down the middle of this double bond, these CH3 groups are on the same side. Same equals cis. So if I were to do the same thing over here, I draw a line down the double bond and I circle my methyl groups or the H's. I could do the H's or the methyl groups. In this case, they're on different sides. So same is cis, different is trans. So this molecule, they're, they're both two butene, but in this one, the CH3 groups are close to each other, and in this one, the CH3 groups are far away from each other. That affects the physical and chemical properties of these molecules. And I can't just flip this one over to turn into this one, because remember that uh, the, a pi bond can't rotate. Sigma bonds can rotate without breaking the symmetry, but a pi bond can't rotate. So this pi bond here, this double bond is locked in place. Cis and trans can't just rotate to become each other. They're stuck this way. Therefore, they have different shapes. Therefore, they are, they're different molecules. So here's another uh, example. I have two H's here. Um, I don't have two methyl groups now. I have a methyl and an ethyl. So the methyl and the ethyl are on the same side, and the H and the H are on the same side. So if I have two groups that are the same, in this case it's not methyl and methyl, in this case it's H and H. If I have two groups that are the same, then I can call it cis and trans. There's two H's that are the same on the same side, so it's cis. Here's two H's that are the same group, but they're on opposite sides, so that's trans. Here's a molecule where I have uh, methyl, methyl, but they're not on different, so if we, draw a line like this too to show that the we're looking at different halves of the double bond then when i say when i'm talking about cis and trans then the groups that are the same have to be on one one of them has to be on this carbon from the double bond and one of them has to be on this carbon from the double bond so if i do that over there over here i have two groups that are the same but they're both on the same carbon atom I don't have one of those methyls on this carbon and then one of those methyls on this carbon. The two groups that are the same are on the same carbon atom, so this is not cis or trans. Um, this would have, uh, this would need a different name in order for us to determine uh, how these are arranged. Although in this one, if I flip the ethyl, right now I have an ethyl next to a methyl and an H next to a methyl. If I were to flip these two groups around, 
then I'd have an ethyl next to a methyl and an H next to a methyl, which is the same that I already had. So in this case, flipping these two groups around doesn't change the molecule. So there's only one version of this molecule. I don't have a cis and a trans version of this molecule. There's only one version of this. And we look over here at the same thing. If I do my little analysis here, I've got, now I have three groups that are the same. It doesn't matter where this one goes. I'm always going to reproduce the same molecule, a molecule that has three H's and this one, two, three, this propyl group right here. And so when I, when, when two of the groups are the same, you can see that they can either be like this on different sides of the double bond, or they can be, or excuse me, the same side of the double bond, or they can be like this on opposite sides of the double bond. But in this case, if I flip them around, it doesn't change in the same way. If I flip these two groups around on the trans, then I generate the cis. And if I, if I flip these two groups around on the cis, then I turn it into the trans. If I flip these two groups around on this molecule, it's the same molecule, because those two groups are the same. And even if I flip these two groups around on this molecule, it's the same, because it's not going to change their relationship to these two groups over here. So when I talk about cis and trans, it, it's a specific situation where the two groups are the same and they're on opposite sides of the double bond. So this doesn't count and this doesn't count. Okay, alkynes are like alkenes, except alkynes have a triple bond. So now we've seen alkane, A-N-E is a C-C single bond. Alkenes, E-N-E, -E, is a double bond, enes, and alkynes, Y-N-E, -E, is a triple bond. So alkanes and alkenes and alkynes are very similar. They just have a different bond between carbon atoms. So that triple bond is very strong. The carbon atoms are sp hybridized in this case, and the bond angle is 180 degrees. And uh, molecules with triple bonds have linear geometry. They, they uh, have 180 degree bond angles. So how do we name alkynes? So when we're looking at a molecule that has a triple bond, we know that this molecule is an alkyne. It also has a branch, and so we would call this branch bromo. Uh, and it's got some carbon atoms and a branch and a triple bond. So it's a bromo, seven carbon atoms means it's a hept something, right? Seven is hept, and the triple bond means it's a, an ine, an alkyne. So this is a bromoheptine. So now we just have to number it the right way and put the numbers in. So I can number it this way, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and start at the bromine. And that would give me one bromo, hept 5 ine right? Because I have the, one, the carbon 1 is here, and the bromine is on carbon 1. And here's the triple bond between 5 and 6, so I would number that uh, 5 ine. Uh, well, the way to correctly number both double bonds and triple bonds is to give them the double bond or the triple bond the lowest number. So even though this gives me the lowest number for the branch, 1 bromo versus 7 bromo, this way gives me the lowest number for the triple bond or double bond, 2-ine versus 5-ine. So the way that gives me the smallest number for the triple bond or double bond is the correct way to number it, even if it means the branches have a bigger number. So this is the, this is the correct way to number this molecule. And finally, um, we'll look at some aromatic compounds. Um, and aromatic compounds kind of look like alkenes because we have carbon-carbon double bonds again. But what's different about aromatic compounds is that the, they're in a ring. Um, and sometimes we can have double bonds in a ring. But double bonds, in, when they have this specific pattern, and it goes double, single, double, single, double, single, double, single, and it just can repeat around in a circle like that, that gives rise to a specific bonding pattern, specific increased stability that we call aromatic. And so um, that's, it's not, this compound right here is called benzene. And this carbon, or this compound has six carbons and six hydrogens, C6H6. And so benzene is um, sometimes seen as like the simplest aromatic 
compound. And this is a hydrocarbon because it's just made from carbon and hydrogen. But aromatic aromaticity or aromatic compounds, what being, being aromatic means that you're extra stable. So this extra stability comes from other, other molecules can have it too. So here's some other examples of molecules that are also aromatic. It's not just benzene. So this one is also a hydrocarbon. It's just made from carbon and hydrogen. But this one is not. Furan has an oxygen atom. Um, but it's still, uh, it's still aromatic for reasons that we won't go into very much, even though it doesn't follow this double, single, double, single pattern, right? It goes double, single, double, single, single. So the reason that I'll just mention briefly that, th that this is aromatic, even though it doesn't follow that pattern, is because the oxygen has a lone pair of electrons that's not pictured here. But the lone pair of electrons on oxygen has two lone pairs, actually. One of the lone pairs on oxygen can create another double bond. One of the lone pairs on nitrogen can create another double bond. Um, this, lo this negative sign, negative charge, means there's a lone pair of electrons here on carbon. That lone pair of electrons right here on carbon can create another double bond. So it actually does follow the double single, double single pattern, just not as currently drawn. We can draw it a different way that would show that it does have that pattern. Um, and this one d follows it too, right? Double single, double single, double single, double single, double single, all the way around in a circle. So there's something about this pattern that makes molecules extra stable, more stable than we would expect them to be given their number of bonds and atoms. So there's also something that's called anti-aromaticity, and it, it looks very similar. Double, single, double, single, double, single, double, single. So this has the same bonding pattern. The difference here is that it has a different number of electrons. So in this, in this class here, at the end of Gen Chem, we're not going to get into the difference between aromatic and anti-aromatic. We'll get into that more when we go into organic chemistry. So for our purposes in this course, if you can recognize that a compound has double, single, double, single, double, single bonding pattern, then we will, we're going to recognize that as being aromatic. We're not going to get into the difference between this and this right now. We'll do that later. So um, benzene, what gives it this extra stability, that more than we would otherwise expect, is because of something like this. When I draw this double, single, double, single, double, single pattern, and I'm trying to figure out, okay, does the double bond go between these two atoms right here, or does the double bond go between these two atoms right here, like it is pictured over here? Is this the pattern of the double single, double single, or is this the pattern of the double single? Well, it turns out that in benzene, they're exactly the same, and what that means is that this bond is not quite a single bond, and it's not quite a double bond, it's kind of both. This bond is a little bit longer than a double bond, but it's a little bit shorter than a single bond. And in fact, all of the bonds in benzene are exactly the same length. So sometimes instead of drawing benzene like this, double single, double single, double single, that sometimes would make us think that the molecule would have a shape like this because double bonds are short and single bonds are long. So early researchers thought that benzene might look like this because the single bonds are long and the double bonds are short. But in fact, this is not the case. In benzene, all of the bonds are exactly the same length. So that means that none of, there's not really a double bond or a single bond in benzene because double bonds and single bonds have different lengths. It really means that all the bonds in benzenes are exactly the same and they're what we might call one and a half bonds. They're, they're not quite single bonds, and they're not quite double bonds. They're somewhere in the middle, all six of them. So um, that kind of ambiguous arrangement of electrons helps to create a, a really stable pattern for the electrons, and that makes the, their energy go down more than we would otherwise expect, and we call that being extra stable. So here's an example of a compound that is not aromatic. And in a compound that's not aromatic, the double bond is short, 1.3 angstroms, and the single bond is long, 1.48 angstroms. So in most compounds, double bonds and single bonds have a different length. But in benzene, all the bonds are exactly the same length, a little bit longer, 
than a single bond and a little bit, or excuse me, a little bit longer than a double bond and a little bit shorter than a single bond, right in the middle. So the reason that that happens is because in benzene, all of the carbon atoms are sp2 hybridized. So remember, sp2 hybridized atoms have an unhybridized p orbital. And it's that p orbital, and all those p orbitals sit parallel to each other around this ring. And it's that p orbital that creates the pi bond that's responsible for creating the double bonds. Well, if I have an electron here, and an electron here, and an electron here, and one here, and one here, and one here. If I have one electron in each of these p orbitals, that because e each carbon brings one electron into the system, just like this, then it really is ambiguous. Where is the double bond? Is the double bond, is it these two orbitals that are sharing the electrons? Or is it these two orbitals that are sharing the electrons? They're all equal, they're all right next to each other, and they all have one electron. So what that means is that they don't actually have to decide. It's not like, well, do I share with my left-hand neighbor or do I share with my right-hand neighbor? They all share with each other, and they create this kind of delocalized system where the electrons are free to move about within this donut. This electron here can move about through all of, all of these orbitals. It creates one big joined system. So we call that being delocalized. So um, here's one measure of that. Uh, here's one measure of the extra stability that we see in benzene that we don't see in compounds that are not aromatic. So the um, the heat of combustion of benzene is 208 kilojoules per mole and the heat of combustion of three cyclohexenes so cyclohexene which is just a, a, a cyclo, uh, cyclohexane with one bond if I had three of them that would be kind of equivalent to three um, double bonds in benzene well three cyclohexenes has a delta H of 159 when we burn it this is how much energy is released when I burn the same amount of benzene, this is how much energy is released. So we say the resonance energy, the amount of, of stabilization, the extra stability that benzene has that cyclohexene does not have because it's not aromatic, can be 151 kilojoules per mole is one way to measure that extra stability just to show benzene is more stable than three cyclohexenes and they should be equal. So there's other ways that carbon can be arranged. We've seen, we've seen earlier that diamond is when all the carbon atoms are sp3 hybridized and they're all single bonded to each other in this tetrahedral network. So all every atom is, is uh, covalently bonded to every other atom, to all, all of its neighboring atoms with these uh, tetrahedral geometry. Um, and it, it creates this kind of continuous interlocking network. Graphite and graphene. Graphite is when I have lots of layers of two-dimensional uh, carbon. So in this case, car all the carbon atoms are sp2 hybridized. And if they're sp2 hybridized, remember that makes them planar. And so if they're planar, they don't kind of make this three-dimensional interlocking network. They kind of make this series of two-dimensional sheets. And so when I have lots of those two-dimensional sheets, it's called graphite. And sometimes that's used as like an industrial lubricant because it's a solid, but it's really slippery. It's a slippery solid because these, uh, these uh, plates of carbon atoms can kind of slip right by each other. And if I have just one single plate, that's called graphene. And graphene has been shown to kind of be a really amazing material in that it's a superconductor and it is potentially stronger than diamond and it's a great thermal insulator. And so when we have just one single sheet of graphene, that looks like this. This is a wonder material that in the future you'll hear a lot more about graphene because it's going to start to be included in batteries and solar panels and everything as we start to, to figure out how to really utilize this material. And other um, 
kind of compounds of the future or futuristic materials that are, are starting to come online now as they've been around for a long time. People have known about them for a long time, but it's been hard to kind of turn them into commercially viable technology. But now we're starting to see um, buckyballs and a buckyball is really like a soccer ball arrangement of carbon atoms. It's pure carbon. A buckyball is 60 carbon atoms and nothing else. There's no other elements. It's just all carbon atoms. And those carbon atoms are all arranged in a soccer ball orientation. And there's double bonds in there. And this compound is aromatic because of the way that the double, that the double bonds were arranged in this soccer ball. So buckyballs are uh, they're named after Buckminster Fullerene, which is the guy who invented the geodesic dome, and these kind of have a, a geodesic dome shape. So they kind of honored Buckminster Fullerene in the naming of this, the buckyball. And um, one idea is that they can, this can act as a cage. And we can, it's pretty big. There's a big opening on the inside. So if we could put molecules on the inside like medicine, and right now, when we take medicine, we just swallow a pill, right? And then the pill kind of starts dissolving in our mouth and it gets into our bloodstream and it goes into our stomach and it gets into our bloodstream. And from our bloodstream, it kind of courses throughout our body to, and eventually reaches the affected area because it's kind of everywhere in our body at the same time, having gone through our bloodstream. But the buckyball might be a way to more precisely deliver medication. So we could put the medicine inside of the buckyball it can get to where it's supposed to go and only when it gets to where it's supposed to go can the buckyball open up and then the medicine would be delivered directly to that spot instead of having to course through your entire body through your bloodstream um, and so that's one idea that people have with these buckyballs is they can kind of use them as molecular cages trap things inside of them and a nanotube is just kind of like an open-ended buckyball. So on one end, you've got the soccer ball arrangement that's closed, but on the other end, instead of kind of bending over back on itself, it just kind of stays open and it acts as kind of like a tube. And so this arrangement of carbon atoms, a nanotube, um, is also a very impressive material because it's it's 10 times lighter than steel and 10 times stronger than steel. And right now, steel is the go-to material for everything that we do. Like right now, steel is the, the most, uh, the, the best material to use for building skyscrapers and for industrial machinery. Steel is kind of the, the number one uh, strongest material. Well, nanotubes are far lighter and far stronger. So if we could figure out how to make them in bulk and start to create uh, structures with nanotubes the same way that we do with steel, then we could do things that are orders of magnitude more impressive because carbon nanotubes are that much stronger than steel.